Well, this morning, we've reached the central section of the book of Leviticus. The pinnacle, the peak. Arguably, this is the peak of the whole first five books of the Bible. The peak of peaks. It's the centre of the central book. So the middle of the, the middle of the, so third book in, so two on either side, and it's in the centre. And in Jewish thought, that's how you make something important. You put it in the middle. This is the high point of the Torah, and it's still the high point of the Jewish calendar to this day. The Jews call it Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. It's the Jewish New Year. Now it's strange then, with it being so central, with it being so important, especially so important in Judaism, that as Christians we don't celebrate it. I doubt actually if anybody could tell me when it was celebrated this year. Just so it doesn't distract you, it's the 9th of October. It sort of passes us by, doesn't it? So we've got a festival, a ceremony, a chapter that the Bible highlights as being of crucial importance. But it would seem, seemingly, that it has no relevance to our lives as Christians. But I want to argue this morning that it is crucially relevant for us, more than we know. The foundations are laid here for the very heart of the Christian message the very centre of what it means to be a Christian. This teaches us about Jesus and the atonement that he made. This is about, about a man entering the abode of God through the means of atonement. This is about how we have a real and living relationship with God. And I want to state that up front so you can think of that as we go through the passage, so it doesn't just seem like some obscure ceremony from long ago. But before we get into the central passage, I want us to look at chapter 17, the bit that comes after the Day of Atonement. Commentators struggle to fit it into the structure of Leviticus. It doesn't quite seem to fit. And I think it's there to give us a lens through which to see chapter 16. It's there to sort of point out the things that are important in chapter 16. So we see two things in chapter 17. Put in the wrong order. Two things in chapter 17. Firstly, there is only one place for atonement. And secondly, that blood is the means of atonement. So firstly, one place. Have a look at chapter 17. I'll read you verses 1 to 9. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to Aaron and his sons, and to all the people of Israel, and say to them, This is the thing that the Lord has commanded. If any one of the house of Israel kills an ox, or a lamb, or a goat in the camp... Or kills it outside the camp and does not bring it to the entrance of the tent of meeting to offer it as a gift to the Lord in front of the tabernacle of the Lord, blood guilt shall be imputed to that man. He has shed blood and that man shall be cut off from among his people. This is to the end that the people of Israel may bring their sacrifices that they sacrifice in the open field, that they may bring them to the Lord to the priests at the entrance of the tent of meeting, and sacrifice them as sacrifices of peace offerings to the Lord. And the priest shall throw the blood on the altar of the Lord at the entrance of the tent of meeting, and burn the fat for a pleasing aroma to the Lord, so they may no more sacrifice their sacrifices to goat demons, after whom they whore. This shall be a statute forever for them throughout their generations." And you shall say to them, any one of the house of Israel or of the strangers who sojourn among them, who offers a burnt offering or a sacrifice and does not bring it to the tent of the entrance entrance of the tent of meeting to offer it to the people, that man should be cut off from his people. Now this is a bit of a strange and controversial section, but it's not really one big point. There is only one place to make sacrifices. No other place will do. And if you read through the rest of the Bible, Israel has a big problem of offering sacrifices in the wrong place. They're always offered that to the high places, to their local mountains, their local hills to offer sacrifices. But here the meaning is clear. There is only one place for sacrifice. And if anyone sacrifices anywhere else, they're to be cut off from among the people. Now, it's unlikely to be saying that every lamb or ox or goat uh, that is killed is to be brought to the tabernacle. That's the way it's a bit controversial. It sounds at the beginning, doesn't it, like every time they kill one, they need to bring it to the tabernacle. Now, that would have a very short lifespan in the life of Israel, if you think about it. It could only really apply to their time in the wilderness, 
when the tabernacle was in easy reach. Once they were in the land, it would be impossible for every shepherd to bring every sheep to the tabernacle when he killed it. You know, it would be several days' journey for a lamb chop. You know, I get, I get impatient cooking it, things in the oven. Imagine if you had to take it several days' journey to have it uh, killed by the priest. Now, the context is sacrifice, and that is the context we should read it in. No sacrifices should be made away from the tabernacle. No sacrifices should be made in the field or in the wilderness, the desolate domain of goat demons, as they saw it. There is one place for sacrifice. There is one place for atonement. But that's something that we see in the Day of Atonement. It's something that we see through the rest of the Bible. What lens does it give us to read the Day of Atonement? Well, we must recognise that this is the one way to atone for sin. There is but one place to come for forgiveness. There is one place to enjoy fellowship with God, and that is the place that God has provided. But how are we to take that in the New Testament? What what do we make of Jesus' statement in John 4? I put it on the back of your notice sheet. I'll read you the fuller quote from 19 to 23. The woman said to him, this is the woman uh, of Samaria. The woman said to him, sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, but you say that that in Jerusalem is the place where we ought to worship. Jesus said to her, woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. But the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshippers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship him. So how come now we can worship God anywhere? It's not just the tabernacle. Well, it's because the one place is no longer a geographical location. That's what Jesus is saying. The one place of sacrifice, the one place of fellowship with God, is now Jesus. He is the true tabernacle. He is the true temple. He is the true sacrifice. And it's only through him that we can come to the Father. So Jesus said this in in John 14, verse 6. Think about this, though, in terms of Leviticus, yeah? John 14, verse 6. Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. He is the one place. He is the only way to the Father. One of the things that we see in the Day of Atonement is that there is only one way to approach God, the way that God himself provides. And for us, that is the Lord Jesus. So that's the first lens that we're to see the Day of Atonement through, this idea of it just being the one place that we can go, the one time when they could approach God. The second lens we're given is in the second half of chapter 17. Let me read to you verses 10 uh, to 16. Actually, yeah, uh, I'll just read 10 to, to 12, I think, actually. If anyone of the house of Israel... Or, or of the uh, strangers who sojourn among them, eats any blood, I will set my face against that person who eats blood, and I will cut him off from among the people. For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it for you on the altar to make atonement for your souls. For it is the blood that makes atonement by the life. Therefore I have said to the people of Israel, no person among you shall eat blood, neither any stranger who sojourns among you, shall eat blood. Blood here is given as the means of atonement. It's the way it happens. And that makes blood special. For the Israelites, that meant that the blood of animals was special. It was by the blood of animals, so to speak, that their atonement was made. The blood was set apart for a wholly special purpose. The life of the animal would make atonement for the death that they had brought on themselves, would cleanse away that death. The life of the animal cancelled out the death merited by the worshipper. And that meant for the Israelites that the blood of animals was off the table, so to speak. It was also off the table for anyone staying in their land. And the passage goes on to explain that birds had to be drained of blood, And that if you found any roadkill, that would make you unclean as the blood hadn't been drained away properly. That's verses 13 to 16. 
Now, there's been a debate since ancient times as to whether this still applies to Christians, with good people coming down on both sides. Part of the complication is that the commandment is older than Leviticus. So God speaking to Noah said in Genesis 9, Every moving thing that lives shall be food for you. And as I gave you the green plants, I now give you everything. But you shall not eat flesh with its life, that is, its blood in it. It's also repeated in the New Testament at the Council of Jerusalem. So James says in Acts 14, Therefore, these are on the back of your notice sheet if you want to follow along. Therefore, my judgment is that we should not trouble those of the Gentiles who turn to God, but should write to them to abstain from things polluted by idols, and from sexual immorality, and from what has been strangled, and from blood. For from ancient generations, Moses has uh, has had in every city those who proclaim him, for it is read every Sabbath in the synagogues. And then the letter that they send out further down in Acts, Acts 14, 28. For it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us to lay on you no greater burden than these requirements, that you abstain from what has been sacrificed to idols and from blood and from what has been strangled and from sexual immorality. If you keep yourselves from these, you will do well. Farewell. I'm not actually going, that's what it says in the passage. It's tricky, but in my judgment, it's okay to eat blood for quick reasons that it doesn't really apply to us. Firstly, the reason that we're given in Acts 14 is that the law of Moses was known all over the world. That's the reason that's given. There was a proportion of Jews in every city that would be offended by those who consumed blood. They were not countenance joining a movement of people who were blood eaters, if you like. And the strategy at that point was to reach Jews first. Paul would go to the synagogue first, and that was the mission strategy of the church in the early days. If we want to reach a large proportion of Jews or Muslims in an area that we want to reach, that similar logic might apply. But in Otley, at the moment, that's not the context so much. So it doesn't seem to make sense to have it as a blanket rule that we don't uh, eat black pudding or blood. Secondly, there's no penalty mentioned in the letter. There was no cutting off the people if they did these things. It just says in Acts 14, 29, if you keep yourselves from these things, you will do well. It's hardly the language that we meet in Leviticus or elsewhere in the Bible for sin, is it? That said, sexual immorality is listed uh, there as well. And that clearly is a sin that did have serious consequences. We see that from other passages. Thirdly, though, Paul allows parts of the Council of Jerusalem not to be applied in various circumstances. So he talks about not eating food polluted by idols. Yet in Corinthians, he writes to them that they're free to eat food um, that's been given over to idols, but to be careful not to lead other people to stumble. So it seems that actually this was quite flexible in different circumstances. And then finally, the point of the passage in Leviticus is to highlight the importance of blood in sacrifice. The reason given is that the blood they would have been eating is actually for God's purposes, for sacrifice. That means as we look at the Day of Atonement, we should take special notice of the blood. It's sort of highlighting it for us, saying, look, look at me, this is really important. But the thing is, for us, animal blood is no longer used for sacrifice as it was in the days of Noah or in the Old Testament. The blood of Jesus has now made those things obsolete. And far from abstaining from the blood of Jesus, we're actually bid to drink it in the New Testament. So John six fifty three. So Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks on my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him on the last day. Think of that with a Leviticus lens on. It's shocking, isn't it? But the life that is in the blood that we talk talk about in Leviticus, Jesus offers his life to us. Indeed, in the Lord's Supper, we symbolically drink his blood every time we celebrate it. It's now his blood that is precious. It's now his blood that is cleansing us from sin. And this commandment is fulfilled as we treat his blood as special. As we accept his shed blood for our sacrifice. 
Because without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. But his blood is the one that atones, not the blood of animals. So commandments to do with the blood of animals, I would argue, are now obsolete. So whatever you think of that, the section here is to show us that blood is special. We need to look for it in the Day of Atonement. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to look through the Day of Atonement and think partly, one of the questions we're going to be asking is, where does that blood go? So the Day of Atonement, uh, chapter 16, not 17. What we see here in chapter 16 is the ceremony in three stages. Stage one, cleansing for the priests. Stage two, cleansing for the tabernacle. And stage three, cleansing for the people. I'm going to put a diagram of the temple, uh, sorry, the tabernacle up there so you can see rather than the headings. But uh, have a look with me again at verses 1 to 6 of, uh, of chapter 16. The Lord spoke to Moses after the death of the two sons of Aaron, when they drew near before the Lord and died. And the Lord said to Moses, tell Aaron your brother not to come at any time into the holy place, inside the veil before the mercy seat that is on the ark, so that he may not die. For I will appear in the cloud over the mercy seat. But in this way, Aaron shall come into the holy place with a bull from the herd for a sin offering and a ram for a burnt offering. He shall put on linen, a uh, holy linen coat and have linen undergarments on his body. And he shall tie the linen sash around his waist and wear the linen turban. These are the holy garments. He shall bathe his body in water and put them on. He shall take from the congregation of the people of Israel two male goats for a sin offering, one uh, ram for a burnt offering. Aaron shall offer the bull as a sin offering for himself and shall make atonement for himself and for his house. To quote Boromir from Lord of the Rings, one does not simply walk into Mordor. Well, the same is true here with the Holy of Holies in the tabernacle. You cannot simply walk into the Holy of Holies. The priest has to be prepared and purified first. It's possible that Aaron's sons had tried to enter the tabernacle, enter the Holy of Holies of the tabernacle, unprepared and unpurified. That might explain why it's mentioned right here at the beginning again, even though that happened chapters ago. It's possible that they did that, and the problem of what they did has been spelled out in the chapters in between. Uncleanness. They're not fit to go before God. Even a priest cannot simply walk into the Holy of Holies. But the priest needs to go into the Holy of Holies if he's to make real atonement for the people. He needs to go into the Holy of Holies if we have any hope of re-entering Eden, of dwelling in the presence of God. Because if the priest can't even do it, what chance do we stand? But as the priest goes in, there are huge restrictions. And this is to happen just for one person and once a year. Bear that in mind as we go through all these sacrifices and things that are made. He must be prepared We're given the clothes that he is to wear, simple clothes compared to what he would usually wear as high priest. His ornate and gem-covered garments were supposed to represent God to the people, show something of the holiness of God. But here, he's to represent the people before God. There's no space for grandioseness, if that's a word, or peacock-like boastfulness. He's here as a man. A second Adam, if you like, entering the Garden of Eden. He's to be dressed humbly because every knee bows before God, whether priest or king or noble. So he's to be prepared, but he's also to be purified. You see those sacrifices in verse 6. As we noticed before, Aaron was not a holy man in the sense he wasn't superior to others. He was a sinner in need of atonement, just like everybody else. We're given the procedure of what he was to do in 11 to 14. Have a look there. Aaron shall present the bull as a sin offering for himself and make atonement for himself and for his house. He shall kill the bull as a sin offering for himself. And he shall take a censer full of coals of fire from the altar before the Lord and two handfuls of sweet incense beaten small and shall bring it inside the veil. And put the incense on the fire before the Lord, that the cloud of the incense may cover the seat that is over the testimony, 
so that he does not die. And he shall take some of the blood of the bull and sprinkle it with his finger on the front of the mercy seat on the east side. And in front of the mercy seat he shall sprinkle some of the blood with his finger seven times. It's almost identical to the sin offering for the priest that we saw in the early chapters. But with one massive difference. In chapter 2 the priest was to take the cleansing blood and sprinkle it in front of the curtain. It's that curtain there here. Just sprinkle it before it. Here, the priest is to go through the curtain, through the veil, into the Holy of Holies, and sprinkle the cleansing blood there. In doing so, he'll make atonement for himself and his family. So he's got to offer this right in the centre of the tabernacle. But that's still not enough. So he has to take incense with him. You read that in verse 13. The smoke of the incense is to act a bit like a smoke grenade. Really, that's the closest you can get. That he may not gaze upon God appearing above the Ark of the Covenant, above the mercy seat. It's as though the smoke from the incense will block the view so he can't see. In Exodus, we're told that the clothes of the priest had to have bells attached to them. Because they were so scared that going in to the, the Holy of Holies, they might just drop down dead if they saw God. So they put bells on so they could still hear that they were alive. If the bell stopped, the priest was in trouble. God will be there. And man cannot see God and live. So the priest must enter through the cloud into the abode of God. And that's a picture that we see repeated again and again. I've got a, a picture I showed you a few weeks ago. If you think about it this way. He enters through the clouds. We saw that creation was almost like a picture of that. That God dwelt above the clouds, if you like. Not in the sky, but in the heavens. So that if we have any hope of getting to heaven, if you like, into the abode of God, we have to go through this cloud like the priesthoods. But as we saw with the Tower of Babel, when they tried to reach it, going into the presence of God is a dangerous thing. And it's only possible through sacrifice. Once inside, he was to sprinkle the blood eastward of the Ark of the Covenant. Eastward is probably a better translation than on the east side. It would almost seem as though he's to stand west behind the Ark of the Covenant and sprinkle the blood eastwards. The cleansing was to travel eastwards from the Ark of the Covenant outwards, as we'll see in the next uh, stage. He was to sprinkle it seven times, symbolising complete atonement for himself, the high priest, and his family, the priests. Without the priests first being cleansed, they could not provide atonement for the people. They were ordinary people in one sense, made holy by God through these sacrifices. So that was the first stage, the uh, cleansing for the priests themselves. Stage two, I always find a bit surprising, or or whenever I've looked at this passage before, but stage two is cleansing for the tabernacle itself. Have a look at verses 15 to 19. Then he shall kill the goat of the sin offering that is for the people, and bring its blood inside the veil, and do with its blood as he did with the blood of the bull, sprinkling it over the mercy seat and in front of the mercy seat. Thus he shall make atonement for the holy place. Because of the uncleanness of the people of Israel, and because of their transgressions, all their sins. And he shall do so for the tent of meeting, which dwells with them in the midst of their uncleanness. No one may be in the tent of meeting from the time he enters to make atonement in the holy place, until he comes out and has made atonement for himself, and for his house, and for all the assembly of Israel." Then he shall go out to the altar that is before the Lord and make atonement for it. And shall take some of the blood of the bull and some of the blood of the goats and put it on the horns of the altar all around. And he shall sprinkle some of the blood on it with his finger seven times and cleanse it and consecrate it from the uncleanness of the people of Israel. This is perhaps the most surprising part of the Day of Atonement. The very articles in the tabernacle must be cleansed and atoned for. The reason given is the uncleanness of the people. We saw last time, didn't we, that the most basic parts of living could make you unclean. Eating the wrong thing, 
reproducing, disease, childbirth, periods, death. We saw how uncleanness was contagious. It spread between the people. Well, the tabernacle was in their midst. Their uncleanness, if you like, could spread to the tabernacle. Indeed, the immediate context is that Aaron's sons have just died in the tabernacle. Dead bodies were one of the things touching them could make you unclean. So the occasion for the first day of atonement might even have been to cleanse the tabernacle of the uncleanness brought by dead bodies being inside it. So the cleansing has to come for the tabernacle. And the cleansing comes as a wave moving from the mercy seat in the west uh, on top of the Ark of the Covenant through the Holy of Holies onto the altar of burnt offering right at the other side. It's as though there's a wave of cleanness, of cleansing, comes through the tent. All the time heading east from the presence of God, expelling the uncleanness outward. Now if you remember, the tabernacle is a picture of the whole universe. That's what we sort of saw with that that diagram we saw before with the heavens and the earth. It was a sort of mini earth in a way, a mini cosmos. This then is a picture of the day when the whole cosmos will be cleansed of sin. That day in the Bible is sometimes called just the day. And actually this day, the day of atonement, is sometimes called the same thing. The day of atonement is a picture of that future cleansing of the whole world. It's a foretaste of what is to come as the cleansing of God will go out throughout the whole world from God's presence. So the tabernacle itself had to be cleansed. That's a picture of what will happen Uh, To our world. But after the cleansing of the priests. And the cleansing of the tabernacle. Everything is ready now. And now comes the climax of the passage. Stage three. The cleansing of the people. What we see for the cleansing of the people. Are two goats. The first one we've met already. The blood was taken into the holy of holies. To cleanse the mercy seat. And the life of the goat and its blood. Was taken into the very heart of. Of the tabernacle. It cleansed the tabernacle. But we're told it was also a sin offering. For the people. We read that in verse 15. Then he shall kill the goat of the sin offering. That is for the people. So it means in some way. That the goat standing in place of the people. Went westwards. Right into the heart of the tabernacle. Right to the holy of holies. As the blood of the sin offering. So that's where one goat goes. The blood of that goat goes west. The other goat is what's been traditionally called the scapegoat. We read about it in verses 20 and 20 to 22. Let me read them to you. And when he has made an end of atoning for the holy place and the tent of meeting and the altar, he shall present the live goat. And Aaron shall lay both his hands on the head of the live goat and confess it over all the iniquity of the people of Israel. And all their transgressions and sins. And he shall put them on the head of the goat. And send it away into the wilderness. By the hand of a man who is in readiness. The goat shall bear all their iniquities. On itself to a remote area. And he shall let the goat go free in the wilderness. The scapegoat really has no other equivalents in the sacrifices. Other than the bird that's released. uh, For the leper being cleansed. The idea, really, of the goat, a scapegoat is similar. The sins of the people are symbolically laid on the head of the goat. And then the goat is sent out into the wilderness, taking their sins along with it from the tabernacle, away from the tabernacle, and away from the people. He carried the sins of the people far, far away. In later times, apparently, they would actually take uh, the goat to the top of a cliff, specifically, and push it off the top of a cliff. To make sure that it didn't come back. To to make the picture that it really was going far, far away. But one goat went with the priest and went west in the tabernacle to cleanse it. The other would be sent away from the entrance to the east, presumably. To carry away the sins of the people. The people and the blood go west. And the sins and the goats go east. It reminds us of Psalm 103 verse 12. As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. The people in the person of the priest, in the blood of the goat, go west. They are allowed into the presence of God. 
In part because the other goat with the sins goes east and takes the sins away. The scapegoat is a wonderful picture of Christ who bore away our sin. Who died outside the camp as Hebrews puts it. The Bible never names it directly, but from the earliest times, Christians have associated the scapegoat with Christ. Jesus bore our sins and died with them. If he has borne them away, then it means that we have no need to fear God. If he's borne them away, then it means that they're dealt with. And brothers and sisters, he did take them away. He did bear them away. Our sins have been dealt with. An atonement has been made. So what are we to take then from this? Well, we remember the lens that we're seeing this through. Go to the one place of atonement. Don't bear the burden of your sins yourself. Don't try and pay for it yourselves, because it won't work. Don't beat yourself up for your sins, thinking that atones for our sins. Don't bear a burden of guilt as far as the east is from the west. That's how far Christ has removed our transgressions from us. But as we've been saying all along, that's actually just a means to an end in one sense, the sacrifice. The end is a living relationship with God. So the big thing that we should take from the Day of Atonement today is to go west. Not the 80s pop group or the Pet Shop Boys song. We're to go west. And what I mean by that is to draw near to God. That's how the book of Hebrews applies all this ceremony. We have a priest who has entered into the true holy of holies. We have a priest whose death tore the curtain in two from top to bottom. Opening up the way to approach God. To dwell with God. To enjoy a relationship with God. Jesus' sacrifice was so effective, so cleansing, so so perfect, that now all who have him as their priest may enter the Holy of Holies, so to speak. God no longer needs to be at a distance because Jesus Christ has opened up the way into his presence. So draw near, go west. If you don't already have a relationship with Jesus as your priest, That means you've missed out on a real, you still have a real opportunity of a living relationship with God. If you have him as your priest. You can have it not on the basis of your good works or worthiness, but on the basis of Jesus' works and his worthiness. You can come to the Father through Jesus the Son. You can know God. But if you're here this morning and you already have Jesus as your priest, brothers and sisters, go west. So often we focus on the blessing of forgiveness and we forget the blessing of fellowship. But forgiveness is a means to an end. The end is fellowship with God. We were made to enjoy a relationship with God, to grow closer to him, to enjoy him forever. Forgiveness is a means to that end. So don't stay outside the tent saying, isn't this great, I'm forgiven. Go west. Enjoy fellowship with him. Don't go east. Go west. He's given us means to enjoy fellowship with him. His word, the Bible, speaks to us. He speaks to us through it. An open line of communication we have. Prayer for us to speak to him. Fellowship with one another. That we might be his arms and feet and hands to comfort and encourage his people. Christ died and rose that he might send his spirit into us who transforms words on a page into living words in our hearts. Who turns mumbled words into powerful prayers as Christ brings them before the very throne of God. Who pours the love of God into our hearts so that it overflows to others and turns our self-centered hearts that long for ourselves into longing for the good of others. God wants us to draw near. So draw near by faith, trusting in Jesus' blood to bring us there. Trusting in the spirit to bring those spiritual realities into our hearts. Go west. The passage finishes with more sacrifices being made. Burnt offerings in 24 to make atonement for himself and the people. I think these probably are far more significant than the weight of history has given them. 
Burnt offerings, as we saw in the first part of Leviticus, uh, do not do the same thing as sin offerings. They deal with God's wrath. Could it be all the rest of it is actually preparation for that? We haven't really got time to think about it. But if they're not the climax, it's a reminder that the work of atonement in Leviticus is never done. Indeed, the end uh, is setting it up for ha- to happen every year. Every year you'd have to go back and do it again because you'd be unclean again. But we have Christ, whose one sacrifice did away with this whole system. Whole, uh, uh, his blood was sufficient to do what centuries of the blood and bulls and goats could never do. So every time we talk about Jesus' death on the cross as Christians, we look to this high point in the Torah. Every time we share the Lord's Supper, we look to the high point here in Scripture. So let me finish with how Scripture interprets this. And think about this in light of what we've seen. This is what we read at the beginning. Think about it now. Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is through his flesh, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith with our bodies sprinkled clean from an evil conscience, sorry, from our hearts sprinkled clean from an even conscience, and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. Amen. We're going to close by singing a wonderful song that speaks of the finished work of Christ. That what they had to do every year, he did once for all time. Let's stand and sing, it is finished, the Messiah dies.